I think, well, we have quite an urgent question to answer together this, uh, this afternoon. We'll talk about why do we engage it to cooperation or competition? And is it a question, is it something embedded in our very nature, you know, like economics would like us to believe, like if we are naturally competitive beings? Is it because we were educated that way? Is it because we're just embedded in the wrong kind of organizational design? So uh, I'm quite happy because I have a very interesting mix of speakers with me on stage. Well, to begin with, Nathan, Nathan Stern. Over there, Nathan, if you could wave at people. <laughs> so it, it's, it means something to have you on stage because, uh, you know, you may have heard Frédéric Laloux telling that collaborative governance is essentially about getting rid of masks, and that's true. And, but uh, it, when you get rid of masks, it also means that there is no barrier, you know. Sometimes when you, you're not a function, you're a person, so tensions can arise. Uh, frictions can happen between people of the team, especially when the heat of the Wisha Fest arrives. And Nathan is a person who helps us a lot, you know, improving our social relation within the Wisha team. So a big thank you, and thank you for being here today. That means a lot. Second speaker is John Alexander from the New Citizenship Project in the UK. So that's a funny story also because we were introduced uh, a few months ago by uh, Ben Knight from Lumio. You may remember Lumio because it, it was a project which was part of the WeShare Awards last year and it's a collaborative uh, decision-making platform. And uh, Ben felt it would be interesting that we connect, so I'm really happy to finally meet you in person. I'm also very happy to finally meet Charles Eisenstein in person. That's the first time you attend the WeShare Fest and I've been involved in WeShare for about three years now and I've been hearing a lot about you, so thank you for being with us today again. And uh, finally, uh, my friend Oscar Bada, who's a game designer and, um, I, I, you know, be, besides my passion from, uh, for post-capitalism and uh, Greek philosophy, I'm, oh, I also happen to be a, a gamer. So we'll talk about collaboration from a game design perspective also. So, uh, you know, we had lunch all together before, the <laughs> before this panel and we thought it would be cool to have a collaborative panel. So. Uh, we'll try and move forward and proceed like ancient Greek philosophers walking in the alleys of Athens. And uh, I think you won't need me as a moderator. I've already take, do, uh, talked too much. So I guess we'll just, I just, you know, throw a question and then go ahead, guys. I, I trust you to be there, to walk like this. Maybe the first question would be, well, you know, Economics, and that's, I think you're the person to start that, Charles, because you, you wrote a book called Sacred, Sacred Economics. And essentially, I think, and it echoes a lot with what you said yesterday on stage, I mean, economics would like us to believe that we are naturally competitive beings. So, like, it, economics has something to say about human nature, which uh, sometimes I feel is simply not true. So what can you tell us about that? Well, yeah. Um a primary assumption of standard economics is that human beings naturally seek to maximize their rational self-interest. And a second assumption is that this self-interest can be measured and best measured in terms of money. And it seems true, you know, like if there's two products, you're going to choose the cheaper one, right? Um, if you have two opportunities, you're going to choose the one that makes more money. So economics generalizes this and turns it into a law of human nature and even a law of nature. But we might, when we think about when this idea became dominant, um, it was in a context of a highly competitive laissez-faire society. So is this really human nature and even biological nature or is this something that was um, the nature of the society at the time that gets projected onto us. And that's what we were talking about at lunch a little bit, thinking like, well, you know, the question in front of us isn't, is human nature cooperative or competitive, but what kind of conditions will bring out the competitive aspect? What kind of conditions bring out the cooperative aspect? And how could we create um, a society and an economy and a way of thinking that 
enhances collaboration rather than making it opposed to the instinct to collaborate. And I think John had, had some actual data to back up this idea that um, both of these are part of human nature. So, so yeah, so I, I think for me, so the New Citizenship Project is basically about two things. First, I, my background's in advertising and brand consultancy, and, 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 but I've combined that with doing a lot of theoretical work. And, and one of the questions that obsesses me uh, from, from coming from that background is, what are we doing to ourselves when we tell ourselves we're consumers 3,000 odd times a day, whether that's through the medium of advertising as a kind of underlying message of, of advertising or or whether that's through the fact that we measure consumer confidence as a key measure of the success of societies, for example. And, and what, it, what contribution are those sort of elements of the narrative of our, of our society, those quite tangible elements of that narrative doing? So we, we did a little bit of research, and I'll just ask the slide to come up if I can. Max? Can you put the slide in, please? <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, thank you. So, so I'll explain this a little bit quickly. So, it, what you've got in front of you, what we did basically was we asked 3,000 people uh, working with YouGov, a, a quite highly respected polling agency in the UK, two questions. Firstly, to what extent do you think it's important to participate actively in society? And secondly, to what extent do you think it's important to be involved in your local community? Then we split, what happened was we split the group into three. So uh, one group just got asked those two questions. A second group was asked, uh, before they saw those two questions, was asked, to what extent do you think it's important to find brands that fit your personality? And the, th and the third group, before they saw those two questions, was asked, to what extent do you think it's important to vote? Now, these are really unsubtle consumer and citizen primes, basically. That's what we were trying to do. And, and the, this is the data that came out. So what happens is, regardless of the extent to which you agree with those first questions. So regardless of the extent to which you say it's important to find brands that fit my personality, if you have seen that statement before you answer the questions about involvement, you are significantly less likely, particularly at the level of local community, you're significantly less likely to say that it's important to participate. So merely by seeing one sentence, not consciously processing, not thinking, what is this telling me? Merely by seeing that sentence, you're making your, we're making ourselves less likely to participate. So now then the question for me is, what are we doing to, to Charles's thing about the conditions? What are we doing to ourselves when, when that is arguably the kind of wallpaper of our world? And I would argue those are exactly the conditions where we think of ourselves, where we position ourselves much more competitively. So I, and so that's my sort of starting contribution to the conversation is, at the moment, we are, we are, I would argue, telling ourselves, and, and I think to, to, to what the lady was saying uh, to, to introduce the session, we're telling ourselves that we are, that the right thing to do is to get the best deal for ourselves measured in rational self-interest in, in, in the short term. And, and, and that is, that's a kind of moral idea that, it, that is shaping how we interact. And, and the question is, how do you then open up the space? How do you fight that, that narrative, right? Uh, Nathan, maybe I would like to hear you on this because y you launched an interesting topic, which is, yeah, the conditions of, of cooperation, the conditions of collaboration. I mean, if we if we are a bit cynical about this, we have to admit that most organiza organizational structures we are in, uh, in uh, well, wants us to compete with each other. Why is that so? I mean, what leads us to do so, Nathan? And we we've been together for quite a long time, so you know us know how it works? Uh, I think uh, as human beings, we are social beings. And we live in contexts, in social contexts. And these social contexts are defining the way we behave. And there is a specific asset that hasn't been refreshed, updated for 2,000 years. It's our idea, our idea of what's good and what's evil. And we live our life in a frame where we think what's good, and we think good is e equates to norms, to values, to principles. And I think this compass we use is really buggy. And it shows us a path that is not the path of cooper cooperation. So I would say 
we are not cooperative as much as we would like to be because there is a poison in our social life. And this poison is the way we define value, the way we define good. For example, um, the sentence which seems quite innocent, do not, uh, do, do not unto others what you don't want them to do unto you, it's, it's quite pervert, it's quite malicious, because it says you can decide what's good without consulting, without getting feedback from others. Why not, why, why should not say, if you want to, if something is good, just ask, just listen to others, people. This sentence is for me a true symptom of our buggy compass. So you are quoting the first version of the uh, imperative category by Immanuel Kant, right? And it's true that there is something a bit violent about this expression of morality. Yeah, don't do to others what, what you don't want to, to be subject to. And, and because it leads us to, and we are talking a bit about game theory during lunch, it leads us to this kind of, you know, I don't know what you want to do, I don't know I want what I want to do, but it's kind of a suboptimal equilibrium, right? So, uh, Oscar, maybe you, we haven't heard you yet. So, what can, because I think video games, to be honest, are a very interesting field. Because it's, yeah, it's, it's a playground where you can observe people in, in the abstract almost, right? Yeah, I, I feel we, we, we so, th so the, the original question was, uh, is collaboration a matter of um, uh, nature, culture, or design? And I think what we, we pretty much evacuated nature early on because we feel that it's pretty straightforward as an answer, uh, that uh, most creatures are collaborative and it's hard to argue with that. And then... Um, Even Darwin would agree on that. I no, we misunderstood da Darwin because he wrote about cooperation between species also. Yeah, so. yeah. But uh, with, with the, the, the data that you showed, uh, what we see is it's also... Uh, once you just uh, color a question, you get different values and different opinions out of people. And so that shows that it's also, like very compellingly, it shows that it's also a matter of culture, right? Uh, and then you have uh, another category altogether, which is a matter of design, right? So uh, when you design a system, when you, when you design a voting system, for instance, it has, uh, it says something about itself, right? So if I refer to game, which is my field, uh, for instance, in chess, chess, uh, in chess you can't kill the king. Why can't you kill the king? Because uh, in, the mil in the Middle Ages, the king was a holy person appointed by God, and so you don't kill the king, you capture them, right? And uh, Francois I, which is a French king, or um, uh, I think it was King Richard that was taken hostage to, they, they've all been taken hostage because you don't kill a king, right? And so, so rules and, and system have a meaning of their own uh, that talk about the society that creates them and talks back to them, right? So as a, any oeuvre, it will say something about the people that created them and then say something back. So I think design uh, has a very important role to play, but it's also, it is intrinsically rooted in the culture that makes it like... Yeah, it's like the chicken and the egg, right? Yeah, exactly. I think, and I think that's something we can see really manifest in a lot of the debates that have been going on about over the last few days. And, and my argument would be that, that we're coming at this, this opportunity of the collaborative economy. We, we're orienting ourselves towards it by default. By th in, in, a, in a thought pattern, that, in a culture that thinks of people primarily as consumers. And as a result, the, 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 the organizations that are, being, that are being created are, are manifestations of that, of that thought pattern and that worldview. So, so the, 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 the starting question, and again, I'm an Airbnb user, lots of people are sort of caveating their critiques of Airbnbs that I, I, would, I would happily criticize and say, that that organization is, arg is arguably a manifestation of a worldview that is seeking to maximize a certain kind of value. And so the, the, what would it look like to, to come into that space with a different inquiry question, to come into that space with a question that's about how can we maximize our contribution to local cultures and to distinctive uh, and to local economies rather than the, the, the sort of default question. And I think this is where design is so interesting because, as you say, design is rooted in culture, but design also has the opportunity to create culture.
<laughs> Just slowing down for a second here. Um, a story came to me that I think um, illustrates that that our um, much of what we take for granted as human nature or even what can be designed. Um, like the whole mindset of design kind of involves stepping back from the system as the designer, coming up with something and then imposing it onto a reality outside of ourselves. But of course the real relationship is more complicated. We design from a context uh, and then our design changes that context and it's a, it's a feedback cycle. So it's a much more organic process. And this attitude of separation uh, is an ideological artifact that is almost unique to modern culture. And the story that came to me was um, from anthropology, where an anthropologist thought, well, I'm, gonna, um, I'm going to bring out the competitive aspect of these children in a tribe in southern Africa. So he had a big basket of delicious bananas and fruit and he put it under a tree and he said to all of the children, okay, it's a race. Whoever gets to the tree first gets the basket full of, of sweet fruits. And so what happened? All of the children held their hands and ran to the tree together and got there at the same time. And the anthropologist said to the fastest child, he said, well, why didn't you run faster and then you could have all of them for yourself and give them to your favorites, you know? And, and he said, the child said, Ubuntu, how can I be happy when my friends are not happy? Because he understood that he's not separate from his friends, that their happiness is inextricably linked to his own. This mentality is not a design feature of our economy. If you want to, you know, and I think that, that the entrepreneurs who started these Airbnb and all these other companies, um, I think that they probably have um, very idealistic intentions and, and they, they have a beautiful vision that they want to achieve, but then you run up against the design constraints of our economy, which force people almost to do things that their heart says no to. For example, I mean, we see this all the time, um, when you need to meet the demands of the market, the demands of the, the creditors, the debt-based money system. Um, so I think that this matter of design goes to a very deep level. So, uh, I mean, and, and I think that raises the question that I'm really passionate about now, which is, which is so how do we start from where we are? How, how do we start from where we are and go, okay, how, how can we start to move into, into this system? How can we start to shape a system which does create the conditions slightly different? Because we're a long way from Ubuntu right now. And, and, and I totally accept you. I, I'm with you. That the, the, so I, I don't know if people were here listening to Jeremiah yesterday and his thing. And, and on the panel with Indy Johar, there was a really quite fun argument where he was, it was quite... Well, yeah, and Indy, Indy's sort of going, we need, to, we need to think of these organizations differently. And, and Jeremiah's saying, but that ship has sailed. So has the ship sailed, or, how, or what can we do? What's our agency? And I think that's a really interesting question. I think the collaborative platforms have a specific effect. They are making us live new experiences. And only experiences can change culture. I think that these experiences we live when we let someone sleep in our bed, take a bath in our bathroom, it's a transformative experience. It changes the way we see other, not as a threat, but as a partner or maybe as a friend. And it teaches us adjustment. So what we have to do when we are in the platform, uh, in an environment of the platform, uh, a collaborative platform, is to adjust one to another. We have to take into account, if we don't want to be fired from the platforms, we have to take into account what people feel. We have to focus on peers' satisfaction. And that opens uh, a lot of uh, opportunities to focus on others' 
or on peers' satisfaction rather rather than on one's uh, opinion or feelings. Yeah, but I, I think uh, on your point, uh, has the ship sailed? Uh, the the answer might be in the way we treat each other as. Uh, or as these platforms treat each other as consumers of one another, right? Uh, and this is very, this is very intrinsically based into design. You can see it, right? When you rate other people on their based on their performance, based on a, on w how they did the service that you want back, right? How is, has that reciprocity served you, or has it been um, some kind of a communi uh, communality relationship that you had? Uh, where you want to offer something to someone and so on, you want to gift something, right? You, you don't really want it back. But then you commodify that into Airbnb or uh, Uber or any platform like that that would, uh, that would say something, that, that their discourse will be, hey, we, we want everyone to share and to help one another, but basically what they're doing is using one another. And I think because it's that uh, sharing system, right? The, the, the sharing design is rooted in a culture that has uh, make us grow apart and consider one another as enemies or competitors. And then when you try to bring that back, people will want a uh, rating system. They will want, you know, eBay stars and so on to, to have um, basically leverages of power uh, onto one another so they can uh, push competition uh, in that kind of I give you and you give me back uh, relationship. And I think uh, one of your questions uh, uh, during our conversation earlier was what can we do? What, what can we like physically and in a design, on a design perspective, what can we do to change that? Well, you can remove those features. You can say, okay, we are not going to have rating systems amongst users. We're just going to have, okay, this person has served however many customers, and so maybe that's enough, right? Or do we have to have intrinsic in the design something that makes us judge one another uh, based on our performance? May for a moment, please. Uh, it's interesting because what you imply here is that you invite us to accomplish some kind of leap of faith. I would. Charles, it's, it's kind of your area here. I mean, would you say that switching to a gift economy it, it implies a big leap of faith? It, it, does it mean we have to remove these systems of control, of uh, social control, uh, which are deeply implemented into the social, uh, the uh, sharing economy platforms? Well, I'm thinking like after several centuries now of centralized control and centralized um, hub and spokes kind of distribution, societies become very atomized, very fragmented. Uh, and it makes it very hard to reconstruct anything like um, a gift economy or anything like a peer-to-peer trust-based economy. Um, so one way to, to look at um, the new collaborative sharing economy platforms, which are still very monetized, and are, uh, but, but one, a, a way to look at them is that they are a step toward the recovery of the um, kind of social and conceptual basis of a gift economy. So, so whereas, um, just to use the hospitality, and it's funny that the word hospitality is what the hotel industry calls itself when it's really a very, um, you know, mercenary relationship. But anyway, to use the hospitality industry, um, we're coming from a place where if you travel somewhere, you go and you stay in a hotel, and um, a total stranger cleans your toilet, you know, and, and prepares your food and makes your bed. And there's no connection that you have between that, between yourself and that stranger. And so now, stepping into Airbnb, again, you're through a centralized system, you are um, connected to a service provider, and it could be the very same kind of relationship, but there's a difference because this is still an individual person and maybe next time you go to New York, you're going to call this person directly. So a relationship can be established. Now the challenge for the um, entrepreneur, for the, for the person, um, for the people running Airbnb or these other platforms is to be able to let go 
and to not try to um, control that relationship. So, um, and that requires some courage because this is the monetization model. Uh, so I think I, I was just going to head because to me that this you're making me think and, it, and it's sort of calling me out on my own criticism of, of certain things and there's, it reminds me there's a lovely thing from improvisational comedy uh, that uh, the sort of core rule of improv comedy is is that you never say no but you always say yes and and I think that's that might be a lovely thing to bring in especially this, in the UK yeah yeah, yeah there <laughs> we go because we're very no but but that, there's a lovely thing of kind of what what would it look like for to, for all of us to say yes and to these organisations and 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 these steps that we're taking and try and say, right, and how do we build the next one? And I think, I mean, just to, to go back to my thing about consumer and citizen, I think that the, the reason why... Uh, so that the, the reason why I think this is such an interesting finding is that, is that we tend to get... It's very easy to get started, and I, I think a lot of the conversation over the last few days has been about at the level of kind of capitalism as a, as a, as a system and, and how we have to change... And you kind of... To me, that's, that feels quite disempowering. And what I like about, what I find interesting in the stuff and why I've set up my organization is, is that when you, think of, when you think of the idea of the consumer, suddenly that becomes, and you look at it through that lens, that, that idea of consumerism is something that we can all change, that we can all kind of challenge that orientation that, we, that we're sort of having, that we're surrounded by. And we all have agency to move, to move beyond that. And so, uh, sorry, I'm just uh, skimming, but the, so for me, the, the, the sort of, and, and I'm sort of realizing as I speak that, that the reason why my organization is called New Citizenship Project is because uh, the platform we try and use, we're, so we're an ideas company, the platform we try and use is, is thinking of people as citizens rather than consumers. So if you think of people as consumers, our pitch is you only ever come up with one kind of idea, which is stuff people can buy from you. If you think of people as citizens, you think of them as potential participants in your cause and your purpose. But and you already lots have. I mean, the first do. step would be uh, if I rely to to what Charles was saying, which is, which echoes a lot with what you're saying right now, because in a way, you know, consumerism invited us to interact with abstract beings, with brands, with corporations, with companies, with governments. These are fictions, right? It's not the same thing to interact with a person. That's a key feature. Even though the control system, the social control system, the sharing economy are deeply flawed, I would agree with you guys on this. It's still quite different to interact with another person. And if you interact with another person as a citizen, as a person, rather than this stupid abstraction of the consumer, it changes things, right, Nathan? Yes. <coughs> And I, I wanted to answer to Oscar about this notion of getting rid of uh, reputation systems. Twelve years ago, I launched a social network, a local one, and uh, it was called Peplad, and um, it was helping neighbors create bonds together. And um, I was really ideologically hostile to reputation system. And it cost me a lot. And it cost a lot to the people involved in the community. Because we are not trained to cooperate. We have to learn. It's new skills, like being a citizen. It's easier to consume than to be a citizen, an involved, committed citizen. And these reputation systems raise our awareness on all these skills we have to learn. And it's a transformative experience to be judged by your peer and to judge him with kindness, with openness, with indulgence. And all these skills are not uh, ingrained naturally. We have to develop them. Maybe they are ingrained, but we can develop them. Yeah, but I, I think, I think uh uh, as you were saying, it's it's a hard path, right? But we have to take the hard path there, right? It's really letting go of, of that assumption that we can resolve a matter. You know, you, we're discussing something and we don't agree on it. But I say, at the end, we say, okay, how do we resolve it? Well, I'm the boss, so I have the last say. So I don't really have to question my my opinions, my authority, anything. I'll just, we'll just resolve by uh, basically questioning a little bit my point of view and then will resort to anything I have to say. And to go back to the panel that was uh, twice removed from ours, uh, 
how do you change from a very hierarchical uh, society where people control and so on? Uh, well, they have to let go of that fiction of I am the one that says something, right? It's a rule of the game that you just have to get, get rid of because otherwise you just rig it for everyone. And that means that from a design standpoint, you just, you're, you're ruining the game for low players and the, the high player basically has no, uh, has mostly uh, no stake in what the company does, right? They, they, don't, they don't have control. What they have control is over uh, some kind of department and that department in itself is, as you were saying, an abstract uh, construct that they have through, it they, they, through which they interact with one person, which is the manager of that department. But it's like, get your thingies to work, right? They're not people anymore, you don't have to know them. And that, uh, getting rid of that, right? Getting rid of seeing the easy part, you know, those people as, as a group, but as individuals that have rights and needs and wants, is something that's really important in the way we transition, because as we said, we, like this theme <laughs> is lost in transition, you, you have a feeling at the beginning of being lost, right? You're like, how can I trust this user? How can I, what system do I resort to to judge one human from another from another, or one, you know, transparent username, uh, black something 66 on the internet? How do you trust them? Well, by default, you have to reconstruct your position from, I trust because I do, uh, from the, the current position, which is, I trust because they have that many stars, that many ratings, and so on. I, I think that trust is, is never um, isolated from uh, rational signals um, and a social context, you know? Like, um, I, I, if I trust somebody, Maybe it's because I just have a feeling that I trust them, but maybe it's also because um, I've seen how they act in the world. Uh, there's some, they're part of my community. I've, I've heard stories about what they do, you know, that all of that uh, is, we, is important. I don't, right? Trust isn't just like the spiritual thing. No, 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 it's, 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 it's not an abstract thing. What I was saying is uh, if you have some sort of way on the internet, to know more about one person. Like, say if Facebook becomes a government thing at some point, or if you have like an official profile, which is that person lives there and they have an actual reality in the world. Well, that person that I know that I can track, you know, they're not anymore, uh, as I was saying, like a transparent username. Then I can relate to them as a person. Yeah, and I think ultimately, like anytime we rely on numbers um, as kind of a substitute for trust, then there are going to be people who can game the system and produce good numbers. I know some, something about that. Yeah. <laughs> Gaming the system is my thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, so there's no substitute for the qualitative, I think. And, and part of the conceit of um, the modern world is that we can um, approximate quality with quantity and um, reduce the world to number. There's a really interesting question that's coming. Uh, in, well, I think it's interesting. <laughs> but, so the, the, this thing about um, trust and trust ratings and so on, it, it, it sort of speaks to one of my frustrations, which is whenever we're talking about, um, when we're, whenever we try and come up with something from a consumer's perspective, you come up with something nice and creative and slick and it's very easy to use, so trust ratings work very well and, and so on. And when, and when we then try and challenge that and say, well, but that seems to manifest some stuff we're not happy about, then, then the solution always tends to be, don't do it. Or, or so I have this, I have this thing about when, when we think of people as consumers, we're very creative and, and in selling to ourselves. And when we think of people as, as citizens or participants or constituents or whatever, all the creativity suddenly disappears. And my favourite example is uh, uh, there's a TV channel in the UK called BBC Three, youth TV channel, hotbed of British creativity such as that exists, and and 
and when it's creating content for people as consumers, they recently ran a consultation on the future of the channel. And what they did essentially was upload a 100-page monochrome PDF to a website and have some drop-down boxes. And it, and it just speaks to the same thing of when, and, and so I'm just wondering what it would, what a, what a civic, a creative civic participatory trust equivalent to trust ratings would be. I'm one, I mean, I've got stupid ideas in, coming into my head about like, could you, do you, do you and your host write it together? Or, I mean, it, you know, nonsense, but, but it's that, do, do those questions start to take us somewhere more interesting as I, as I think that's what's going on in my head anyway. Interesting. You wanted to react? Oh, yeah. No, what I, what I was saying is like, uh, but then you go back to, you fall back in the trap of, you, then you want to consult everyone, and then you have to kind of reduce everyone to numbers, right? So you, you introduce voting system, which in themselves has, have, you know, as uh, they have uh, a rhetoric to themselves, right? If you have first past the post, or if you have rating system or ranking system of, of any kind, they already say something, uh, they have uh, bias in themselves, right? So anytime you design a system of expression uh, for a large group of people, you have to reduce them to numbers in some way. Yeah. Just uh, to, to step on that, I think what I hear here, you know, Charles was, was talking about the fact that we tend to reduce quality to quantity to have these proxies, right? And it, it's true because I, I, what I hear here is that, you know, how do you scale a community? You know, we're supposed to be wired to be able to have natural communities of 150 persons, approximately, that the Dumba number. And um, as, as soon as we have to interact with people whom which we don't know, you know, it's not my mother, it's not my cousin, it's not my friend, you know, I cannot know all these people. And how can I interact, how can I cooperate with these people? I mean, it's, it's not about... You know, it's easy to collaborate with people you know, you trust, but uh, not always, by the way, but it's supposed to be. But as long, as soon as it gets bigger, as soon as I don't know who you are, um, how can we overcome, overcome that state? Or should we maybe go move and build villages again and stop living in cities? But <laughs> no, I mean, since you designed this poplar, for instance, you, it was made to connect neighbors through the internet, right? What? <laughs> it's weird. Um, I think we can see collaborative consumption, collaborative economy as a Trojan horse for cooperation. Uh, it shows us models of what can be done and we can say some, we can be reluctant to uh, rating systems, etc. But they are incredibly efficient there's no cup, there's no trials on Airbnb. There's no coercion, almost no. So it's social systems that are quite non-violent compared to a city or a country. So these people, the editors of platforms, have built social systems with a very low pressure on people. And that's why I think it's inspiring, and we should think about family, about couple, about schools as platforms. And today, schools are violent platforms. They exert a strong coercion. Especially, on yes, in France. I mean, I've been, I've been raised, I was born and raised here, and we have a very competitive and elitist system, right? It's about getting on the top. And it starts, yeah, it starts with education, and, right? And, and, uh, and it's also very individualistic, right? You, you, at the same time, consider every individual that never, they never collaborate in some way, and then you also erase the idea of individuality and, and of uh, original creation from one person by basically erasing every difference and saying, everybody shut up, I'm teaching here, and, and you, you can question, like, you can ask a question if you didn't answer something, but you cannot question my, my yeah, I, I used to get humiliated by my teacher if I was to do so. Yeah. I think I, I totally agree. Education is a really interesting sphere, and, and we could look at many of that. But, uh, so in education in the UK, there's even a, there's a competition in schools that's government-funded called Young Consumers of the Year. And it's, it's, it's really fascinating. 
I mean, I mean the, the idea of it is it's an ethical consumer thing, is sort of know your rights and so on, but, but just think about the language and the, and the, and the sort of thought structures that that's, that that's sort of implementing, that the right thing to do is to be a good consumer. And, I, and, and, and it, it, so it becomes a really right. interesting creative and generative question to ask, well, what, what, what is education for and how would you design an education system that was about create, about sort of, uh, help me, like kind of fostering citizenship and, and, and participation and, and, and collaboration rather than an education system that's designed to sort of find the people who are going to rise to the top. My, my children have gone to an experiment along those lines. Um, one, and I don't have time to say much about it, but one of the features of it is that there is um, age mixing. You're not just with people of your own age. So um, that creates a lot, more a lot more cooperation because the 15-year-old isn't in competition with the 10-year-old. The 15-year-old knows that he can outperform the 10-year-old in everything, so instead he's going to help the 10-year-old, perhaps, um, which is what happens in, in that school. And, and I guess, you know, we're just so accustomed to competition pervading every aspect of society, uh, and, 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 and we're at the edge of a new territory. Um, and and with, with the Dunbar number thing, I mean, that's... That's, this is new. We, we have never had um, a society of any scale that's fundamentally based on cooperation and, uh, um, and non-competition. We've never had that. We don't know how to do that. And I, that's why I'm, I take a very generous view of even, you know, the ones that are criticized, the Ubers and the Airbnb. Like, we're just experimenting here. And as long as we can have the humility to say, you know, that experiment didn't work so well. Uh, <laughs> let's make some changes. Like, the only way to find our way is to get lost. Yeah, what, when I, what I just wanted to react, yes. <laughs> what I wanted to react on there is, uh, I think every, all of these, are, all of these principles are based on recognizing weakness in one another to help us design collaborative system, right? We lack something. We specialized, so we lack a lot of things. And if we can recognize that uh, as you know, our qualities, right? We, I lack like that, so I, I need people that do that. And I don't need them because I want to give them something and they give me something back. I need them because as a human, I need people around me to help me. I think uh, that change of paradigm of culture uh, recognizing weakness as something that is part of ourselves and that we need not to hide away but to express uh, so that people can recognize it and, and come to us to, to cover our needs. Uh, I think that's a very, very important part of uh, what you were s talking about. There's a danger of uh, anticlimax after Charles brings something to such a beautiful point. But I, I just wanted to, my last contribution would just be, I think it's really interesting to what this, con the sort of hints of education and uh, start to say about where the collaborative economy is in this whole movement and and the, the sort of humility at the level of the collaborative economy movement to recognize that it's, it's, a, it's, it's part of something. And, and just as Ken, the work Ken Robinson's doing on education is exploring what a collaborative education might look like. It's not just the internet tech platforms. It's, there's, there's people exploring this stuff in all sorts of different ways in different places. And, and seeing that whole, I think, is, is quite empowering as a, as a, as a, as a shift. The last um, word is for you, Nathan. I would say we, we need uh, a compass that works, a compass that show us that shows us the cooperation path, and it's not at all the case today. We have to to consider that our ability to get knowledge uh, about what others think and feel is very weak today. We have to develop it. We have to uh, improve our ability to feel the interdependence. Uh, that l that's what I wanted to say. Thanks a lot, guys. Very good discussion. I was happy to be able to have this with you on stage. We're going to pass the mic now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.